When writing was introduced, it was meant to make life easier, to let us know what was in a jar, how much money people owed the bookie, things like that. What might have been a surprise, though, was that the introduction of writing created a whole new industry, one that survived to this very day, one that permeated every facet of society. But how those who write, whether that means scribes, authors, journalists, or otherwise, are treated, and more importantly, how and if they can make a living solely off of their writing has varied across not only cultures, but history. What was once considered almost godly has come to be practically synonymous with a mere hobby. So how did we get from almost being praised to being on the outskirts of society? Welcome to the history of writing. We touched on scribes in the last video, noting how those who took on the rigorous training necessary to write cuneiform receipts uh, at the advent of writing were generally treated as part of the privileged elite. Well, the profession would eventually lose almost all of its prominence long before the printing press was invented, but that privileged elite status continued for quite some time. In Egypt, for instance, the scribe or sesh was one of the most important professions, making up an entire level of the bureaucracy, with scribes overseeing administrative and economic activities and even acting as foremen to construction projects and chronicling stories from the lower classes. Scribes were the protectors and developers of ancient Egyptian culture. They not only preserved existing texts, but edited them and wrote new ones. And get this, they were considered members of the royal court and didn't have to pay tax, undertake military service, or even perform manual labor. Yes, the ability to write guaranteed a superior rank in society, a chance to advance a career, even wealth, land, and power. I mean, there's a reason King Tut included writing equipment in his afterlife necessities. A few couple hundred years, maybe, later, in the late Roman and early medieval period, copying and preserving texts moved from secular professional scribes to monastic ones. That is, scribes based in a religious settlement. Monks. At this time, every book was made by hand. Monks cut the parchment, made the ink, wrote the script, bound the pages, even designed the covers. Every day, except on the Sabbath, the monastic scribes woke to morning bells and worked copying classical and religious works until the evening bells, with just the lunch between and, you know, chances to go to the potty. They only worked during the day, since candles were a little too expensive and their lighting pretty poor. Coupling that with the intricacy of their work, this meant monastic scribes were only able to produce three to four pages a day at most, which is why it typically took about 15 months to copy a single Bible. You can imagine they probably got a little bored, or at least a little touchy. 15 months just copying a Bible, and that was their whole life. Copying a Bible, they finish it, they copy another Bible. So what else are they going to do except maybe kind of complain? And where would they complain? In the books. This marginalia, so-called, of course, because they were typically written in the margins, included thoughts about work, thoughts about the tools they used, sometimes thoughts about the conditions they were under. Generally, again, most were complaints or excuses. But not everyone would see these comments, these marginalia. That's because the process was so time extensive that books were still far too costly to be considered widespread. They were a luxury, the Lamborghinis of their day. And this marginalization of books stuck around for some time. Writing was left for the monks in the mountains to do what they had to do. Sometimes they weren't even literate. They didn't read what they wrote. And this continued right through the age of Shakespeare and the Renaissance, when the writing industry took another interesting turn. During this time, during the medieval and Renaissance period, society was built on patronage. Now, this wasn't like we see patronage today. In fact, 
patronage wasn't an option in this era of society. Everyone was expected to be a patron to people below them on the socioeconomic scale, and no one was ever high enough to never require patronage themselves. Well, except, you know, maybe a king. Patronage was the key to social status. Social mobility was impossible unless you were involved in some sort of network of patronage relationships. But what did a patronage relationship actually entail? Well, let me explain. In short, riders didn't make any money. Their profits instead came from their patrons. So in exchange for food, lodging, and prestige, riders, particularly poets, would dedicate their work to their benefactors and often even write pieces exclusively about their patrons. Pieces that would then praise them, extol them, show them in a good light. For patrons, it was all about the social standing. If you sponsored several clients, for instance, that would indicate you had a nice fortune and an active interest in the community. Plus, if you were a patron of a notable client or two, such as Shakespeare, for instance, that would also add to your prestige, of course. This system, it worked pretty well for a while and obviously led to a number of classics, but as economies and societies worked beyond the barter system and relied more on cash, patronage sort of fell by the wayside. Riders started looking for actual tangible profits. It's hard to pinpoint when this shift first started, but many attribute it to the Greek poet Simonides, who wrote for money, kept precise books, and would go on to become famous for being stingy and putting money above all else. And once Simonides got the ball rolling, it never stopped. Thankfully, the search for profits worked well for many an author. Before movies and television, in the age of, of screenplays and sideshows, writers could make quite a living for themselves. Some were more successful than others, of course, but the search for profits, the search for more money, brought us works from some of the most prolific names in all of literature, from Jonathan Swift, Jules Verne, Walt Whitman, Edgar Allan Poe, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, to name just a few. With the success of so many writers, more and more people wanted to join in, especially with the rising literacy levels. So, more people were coming in trying to write their own books or looking to publish those of others for a portion of the profits. So steadfast was this search that writers were eventually paid by the word to produce stories, which in part is where we are today. Not all that long ago, the bottom of the barrel, the scourge of the industry were Pulp Fiction writers. They were paid one to five cents a word and averaged somewhere in the range of 3,000 to 5,000 words per day, meaning they made some $30 to $250 per day whenever they could crank those pages out, something they took explicit pride in being able to do. Mind you, the majority of these were never classics and they were never meant to be. They were simply something that was put out for people to read, to consume. They're, they're not something that you're going to read in school now or back then. These are the kind of books you'd read with your buddies when your parents weren't looking and then stashed under your mattress. And they eventually helped give rise to comic books. But the problem with pulp fiction books and the problem with books in this era when writers were being paid by the word, by the sentence, by the paragraph, by the chapter, was that it helped devaluate writing. It meant authors were simply making a product to be paid as much as possible. Pretty much as a factory worker would. The more that they can produce, the more money they would be paid. Making books, making writing, not something that is a niche product anymore, but something that would be consumed en masse. Something that would help sell magazines and help sell ads to crank out even more money. And you know, being paid by the word remains a common practice to this very day especially for short freelance writing. Analog, a science fiction magazine I once submitted a story to, for instance, still pays eight to 10 cents per word for short stories up to 7,500 words. It's right there in their submission guidelines. A lot of uh, news websites that you probably read pay often by the word, by the length of a piece, uh, and then dependent on clicks and views and all that sort of thing. But despite that practice being so prominent, there are still a number of examples of the exact opposite, where 
other things are used to help sell a piece of writing. Playboy, for instance, uses an altogether different lure to sell itself. But if you've ever picked up a copy just for the articles, you know that Playboy has been home to some of the most prolific writers of the past two generations. It's published original pieces from the likes of Kurt Vonnegut, Jack Kerouac, Margaret Atwood, and Stephen King, among others. Of course, whether it's by the word or by the installment a la Charles Dickens, being published today, as it has been for the greater part of history, still brings a certain level of prestige. Which is why you'll see everyone from politicians to businessmen to self-help gurus working with a ghostwriter or two to push out their newest, greatest title. Because nothing quite says, hey, you should listen to me, like the words, New York Times best-selling author. The majority of authors today, though, don't have a New York Times bestseller. And they won't, because they work in other media, like television, film, video games, and the like. They're often integral to the pieces that you love, but rarely get any kind of credit. And you may never have realized it, or may never realize it going forward, until you face something like the 2008 Writers Guild of America strike, and it just so happens to derail your favorite TV show, like Lost or Breaking Bad. So, yeah, they work their buns off, but chances are, you'll never even know their names. And today, those writers are still very much an exception, because the vast majority of writers, not only will you never know their names, but they will never be able to make a living off of their work. Well, yes, we get the working stiffs that I just mentioned, and we sometimes get those occasional success stories harkening back to the days of true authorship. J.K. Rowling, Stephanie Meyer, and E.L. James, to name just a few recent examples, as well as the author brands, like the aforementioned Stephen King, as well as James Patterson, Sue Grafton, Tom Clancy, everyone like that. We're not all going to be millionaires. Probably not even going to come anywhere near that. Writers today, for the most part, they teach. They program. They work at customer service. Or if they're lucky, they may land an editing gig at the country's largest health insurer. It's something we've learned to live with. Selling our soul so we can pursue our passion and try to pitch it toward what seems to be an ever-shrinking audience. And while that might be considered okay, and it's something, again, that we live with, and we're making do, and I think we still do get those success stories. It's something I think, as a consumer, you should probably be a little worried about, or at the very least a little annoyed. Because the fact that a majority of modern writers now have to supplement their craft with a full or part-time job means they're not using the bulk of their time, especially their productive time, to hone their writing. While you're anxiously awaiting their next piece, they're too busy filing forms, responding to customer complaints, folding pieces of laundry. To many of today's writers, even those who end up with a New York Times bestseller, even those who get published multiple times, writing can almost be considered nothing more than a hobby. It can't be their full-time job. It's just not lucrative enough in this current economy. In fact, as I've said, the majority of writers today make absolutely nothing on their writing. They put up blogs, maintain websites, produce videos for nothing but the hope of capturing some attention and getting some sort of break. I'm guilty of this myself. I've written three novels, self-published two of them and a short story, and have been doing drunk on writing for close to six months now, with very little to show for it. But I still do it, because I enjoy it, because I love it, because it gives me an outlet for my writing, for my creativity. And I believe in it, I believe in my product. And yeah, you know, I'm hopeful for a break too. But until then, and even after that happens, if it ever happens, I'm gonna work my ass off getting these ideas out of my head and before your very eyes. And that level of dedication, I think, is why patronage is making a comeback. That is, of course, crowdsourced patronage. Kickstarter, Patreon, which I use. These platforms allow fans, patrons, 
to support the creators they believe in and enable them to concentrate on their work instead of doing some menial task that they really shouldn't be. Because who knows where that next Shakespeare is going to come from, right? Writers may not be gods. We may not be nobility. But I think we're damn sure worth the time and the attention. This has been Drunk on Writing's History of Writing. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to the channel. Head on over to patreon.com slash drunk on writing and sign up. You can get exclusive access to behind the scenes looks, um, blooper reels, extra features, extra videos. See everything in advance. See it before anyone else. Tell me what you want me to write about, to record about. Ask me any questions. All sorts of stuff. It's friggin' cool. As is being a patron. Because you guys are the ones that make all of this happen. That's why I do it. <laughs>